What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. Today we're going to be having a look at some of the things you guys at home can do to help sharks. I get asked this question all the time in my everyday life and here on Shark Bites, so I thought it would be a pretty good idea to do a video on it. Many of you out there won't have dedicated your professional lives to sharks and shark conservation. And that's okay, sometimes life just has other plans. But even though you've not worked in this area in a professional capacity, I imagine there's lots of you out there that truly do care about sharks and importantly, want to do something to help. So this list you'll hear today is gonna to be slightly different to the ones that you will read on the internet. I feel like on those lists, you sort of get a generic feel about them as if they'd been copied and pasted. Instead, I'm gonna go into some real detail on some of these things while also at the same time, providing you some things that you should definitely not be doing. I should also point out here that these four things you can do to help are in no particular order, but some of them can directly help sharks and then some of them will indirectly help sharks. Right, okay, first up then we've got eat sustainable seafood. What we choose to eat is a personal choice and I'm a firm believer of that and always have been. I decided back in 2017 that I was going to become a vegetarian because I wanted to. I knew it was going to be pretty tough for me coming from a family of meat eaters with no vegetarians in my family at all. So I decided to do it the long way, cutting out different meat groups year on year as part of my New Year's resolution. And as of New Year's 2021, I was vegetarian. That means that I no longer eat seafood, which for me was a really difficult thing to do because seafood is by far my most favorite of all of them. I do treat myself once a year though on my birthday to a seafood meal of my choice and I'm pretty content with that. But there might be lots of you out there who also love seafood and want to continue eating it and that's totally okay provided you eat sustainable seafood. This one doesn't necessarily help out sharks directly, but it definitely helps the ocean, which indirectly helps sharks. Overfishing and bycatch represent the biggest threat to sharks globally and realistically to the whole ocean as well. So what makes seafood sustainable? Well, it's generally agreed upon that sustainable fishing practices don't overfish. Instead, they take care to not remove too many fish from the population. They also create low levels of harmful bycatch, particularly for endangered species. Sustainable fisheries limit the amount of impact they have on the ecosystem with their boats and the type of gear that they use, and they adhere to a set of enforceable rules rules that make sure all of the things that I've just mentioned to you happen. There are loads of places online where you can read and learn more about sustainable fisheries. I think the Marine Stewardship Council is one that springs to mind. But one of the most basic things you can do if you're out and about at a restaurant or at a fishmonger's looking to buy some seafood is ask. Ask what kind of fish it is, where does it come from, how was it caught, does this fish come from a sustainable fishery? And if in doubt, or if the person doesn't know the answers to your question, it's probably just easier to give it a miss on that occasion. Also, every now and again, it's important to be cautious because often fish can be mislabeled, which can definitely be problematic. Watch out for names like rock salmon or rock eel or huss or flake, because these are all other names for shark. But it can also happen with all sorts of fish, so before you buy something, have a quick Google just to see if there are any other names for the fish that you're about to buy. Okay, next up, some of you guys might like this one. It's dive with sharks. Marine ecotourism is one of the most popular types of potential conservation action, but you do have to be a little bit wise with it. Some wildlife tourism can help sharks on occasion, but we have to remember that it's not the ultimate solution to all shark conservation issues. There's that age old argument that is a fisherman can kill a shark and then sell it once, but if that same shark is alive and well on a reef, that can attract tourists who want to come and scuba dive with it, which then provides the locals with incentives to protect the sharks instead of fishing and killing them. And while that argument is relatively straightforward, the evidence for it is slightly mixed. For example, wildlife tourists can't dive with and encounter all of the threatened shark species. Many of them live in inaccessible parts of the ocean, far out at sea or down in the deep. The majority of sharks that are encountered by wildlife tourists tourists aren't really that threatened. So it means although marine ecotourism contributes to shark conservation in some places, it's not a major solution to global threats faced by many threatened species of shark. Alongside this, in these situations, we have to make sure that the people who are losing income when new conservation measures come into play, i.e. local fishermen, are the same people that benefit from an increase in wildlife tourism. And often, sadly, this isn't the case. 
For example, if you go to the Bahamas to do shark diving, many people will spend their entire time on a liveaboard via companies that are rooted in America, which means the very people who ended up out of pocket from the stricter fisheries regulations, the Bahamian locals, don't actually see any of the money. That means it's massively important that you choose the correct ecotourism operator or dive company. There are loads of really good conservation-minded local operators all around the world. You just have to do a little bit of research to find them. These types of operators will generally take great care in educating their customers with real shark facts and give them ways that they can help. Importantly here though, on the flip side of this, there are also lots of bad operators. These are the operators who don't really share any factual information about the sharks and end up engaging in pretty harmful behaviors like kissing them or touching the sharks or flipping them upside down. You get the picture. That's not the type of tour operator that you want to be engaging with and tour operators like that are definitely not helping sharks. So make sure you take some time and do your due diligence. Oh my goodness. Do your due diligence. That is a ridiculous thing to try and say. <laughs> What was I saying? Do your due diligence because yeah, there are sometimes bad tour operators out there, but there are also good ones as well. And I promise you, if done the right way, not only will you help sharks, it'll also change your whole view of the world. Okay, next up then is volunteer with or donate to reputable charities or NGOs. This one again involves a little bit of time and research on your part. There are lots of really great shark charities or non-government funded organizations, NGOs. You just need to spend a little bit of time looking looking for them on the internet. First off, it's much better to support an existing charity than to start your own. If you care about sharks and want to help them, but you don't have any training, experience, credentials, or knowledge on conservation and policy, then it's probably best to support an existing charity than to start your own one. By creating your own without the know-how, this can dilute the donations pool, which may take funds away from the organizations that can and do have a massive impact. There's a bunch of great shark charities out there, so I'm gonna give you a few to start you off. The Shark Trust based here in the UK is probably our biggest NGO in this country. They've got tons of educational information on their website, regularly engage in public education efforts and run campaigns to help protect sharks. Mar Alliance is the next one that you should definitely check out. So the vast majority of NGOs are either based in Europe or North America, but Mar Alliance do some amazing work in Central and South America. They do lots of their own research, engage regularly with public education, but are also really committed in their outreach to fishing communities. Project Aware then is next up on my list, and if there's any scuba divers out there watching this, you may have heard of them before. Project Aware have made huge differences in the diving community across the world, creating initiatives specific to divers, like implementing codes of conduct to make sure divers don't damage and harm the ocean and its habitats. They also allow their members to actually vote on the issues that they believe matter the most. So if you're after a really democratic NGO, this is the one for you. So those are just a few there to kick you off, but there are loads of them out there. You just have to spend some time and look for them. But Chris, I hear you say, how do I know which ones are the good ones? Well, there's a few questions that you can ask yourself when you find one. Number one, have I ever heard of them before? If not, it might just indicate that they're new. However, it might also mean that they've got no track record of successful outcomes. Number two, do they have a website that's easy to determine what they do from just looking at it? Not being able to find a website for an NGO is usually a bad sign. And if they do have one, you're looking for key details about what they do and how they do it. Three, does the NGO engage with real science and evidence? You're looking for a charity here that's actively engaging in scientific research to provide evidence to support their conservation goals. Do they employ scientists, work with scientists, or incorporate scientific research within their activism? If not, be wary. Four, do they work with other nonprofits? Collaboration, particularly with other NGOs that have a good reputation, is a great sign. If there's no collaboration with other NGOs at all, this could mean that no one else wants to work with them or they're working on things that don't actually matter that much. So no collaboration is a red flag. Take the time to familiarize yourself with some of the good, reputable NGOs out there. And once you've found some good ones, offer all you can to help, whether that be through donating some of your hard-earned cash or volunteering with them in any way you can. Okay, last on this list then, 
today, we've got submitting formal public comments. There are many different ways that you guys at home can have your say on policy and laws that are either related directly or indirectly to sharks. In the UK, you can write to your local MP on issues that you feel really strongly about and make sure you send multiple letters. In the US, you can write public comments to organizations such as NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Legally, they're obligated to consider and respond to formal public comments that are made via their official portal. Doing things like this are considerably better than signing online petitions. A lot of online petitions are so badly written that they end up being ineffective or on occasion counterproductive. That doesn't mean they don't have their place though. They can on occasion be useful, provided they're part of a thorough, well-researched conservation campaign. But I'll say it straight up, most of them aren't. There's often petitions which have tons of misinformation in them because they've been written by well-intentioned people who have no knowledge or experience of the issue they're writing about. Sadly, these kind of petitions aren't helpful and 99 times out of 100 will change nothing. Submitting formal public comments or writing to your members of parliament in support of or opposition to proposed management changes can be helpful. But again, it takes time to formulate and write out a good public comment. My best advice for those of you out there that might wanna do this is to Google how to write a good public comment and that will set you on your way. So there we are guys, those are in my opinion, the four best things that you guys can do at home to help sharks. There's lots of do's and don'ts in there. So take your time, do your research and get out there and start helping. I know the majority of people who watch this channel love sharks and want to help them. Weirdly, there are still some people out there who watch the channel who absolutely hate sharks, which I do find is a slightly strange concept, but most of you out there love them. So if you feel like you want to help, get out there and do it. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. But before you click off, because I know there's lots of you out there who like to click off right about now, I can see it from this graph. Before you do that, you might want to click on this video right here. Today, we've spoken about shark conservation and some of the things that you guys can do to help. But what are the things out there that are threatening sharks? Well, in this video right here, you get a detailed analysis of some of the biggest threats that sharks are facing in our oceans today. And spoiler alert, it's not shark finning. So if you want the true answer, give it a watch here.